Goodness, I don't know if there's anything that I can add to what we've had in Sunday school, what we've had here in praise and worship. All I'm going to do is convene to the Holy Spirit and let Him do His thing. Uh, man, it's been a great morning already. I hate to mess it up. Uh, before we go in the Word of God, let's, uh, let's bow our hearts in prayer. Father God, Lord, I pray that you forgive me the sins I've committed against you and you alone. Lord, that you would clean this vessel, that your Holy Spirit may be able to be poured out into the lives of this congregation. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. Lord, we thank you for using the broken to complete your design. Again, Lord, may your Holy Spirit speak and proclaim the truth within your word of your precious Son. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. We are continuing in the book of Acts this morning. We made it through a whole two verses last Sunday. <laughs> And I'm not saying we're going to make it through much more today, but uh, we're going to we're going to let it ride. It's it's amazing. Me and but Mr. Buddy were talking earlier before Sunday school how just God continues to reveal through His Word. It's never a uh, the same old same old. Whether it be the stage of life that we are in particularly ourselves, or whether it is just the Spirit illuminating something we have missed in prior readings. But uh, He is faithful to present something new each and every time. His Word is alive, has always been, and will always be. Saying that, we're going to start in verse 3 of chapter 1 in the book of Acts. And uh, while we're all getting there, I'm going to just give us a, 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 I guess a preview, a summary of where we were last week. We determined that this is Luke, and this is his second account, a part two, so to speak, a sequel to his gospel, to Theophilus, uh, written to Theophilus, about the ministry and continued ministry of Jesus Christ. We got to the point where uh, the Holy Spirit is sort of presented once again to this new uh, group of believers that we will uh, eventually call the Ecclesia, the church. Uh, and this is not only to those there that witnessed the earthly ministry of Christ, but also today. It's just as relevant, just as prevalent, and just as needed today as it ever was. And in verse 3, as we continue along, it says, "...to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them..." during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And we look at this, and then we know this is him saying that this is the account of Christ Jesus after his resurrection, and after he has presented himself still in flesh. Let's not forget that, that this is still Christ Jesus in the flesh, still bearing the marks of what he endured through his beatings and the, the scars from the thorned, cro uh, thorned crown placed upon his head, the piercings in his hands and feet and in his side are still there. The beatings, the lashings are all still evident in this earthly flesh that Jesus has taken on. And... We know that because when we went through and, and looked at some of the gospel accounts, we know that they were startled. 
and did not recognize him for who he was until something he did or said brought the reality home that this is our Messiah. These infallible proofs, this is uh, something I love because we have ten instances through the Gospels of what is probably many more. You know, John said that, that he could write an endless book of what God did and performed, or what Jesus did and performed after His resurrection. But we have ten of those actually witnessed and written upon within the Gospels. And we know that these things are infallible just because of the sheer amount of witnesses that saw this. And this is the only opportunity that you're going to find that gives a time frame specifically for how many days he was with the apostles after his resurrection, 40 days. It's the only account that's given of that. And we, I'm thankful for Luke and how diligent he was to never skip a detail. He left nothing out. And what's beautiful about this is that ending of that sentence that says, And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. The message never changes. The direction of our praise never changes. The purpose of our ministry corporately as a body of Christ and individually as independent believers, our duty never changes. Who we serve never changes. We talk about Acts being a model for us and we're going to see that and it's going to become more evident as we go along. But that is probably the first thing that we need to adopt. It's not Wednesday night, Sunday morning, maybe a Sunday evening, you know, that we choose God. Man, but how many people how many people that call themselves quote-unquote Christians do that very thing? If, I want to, if, I, if I'm completely honest with you guys today, the thing that struck me so much about Jimmy's message this morning that the Holy Spirit just convicted me dearly. And I can't help but to talk about that this morning. I'm sorry, uh, but... Yesterday, if you ever had to buy materials or anything like that from Home Depot or Lowe's, you would go in there and you would look and you would see and wonder, how in the world does this place stay in business? If they are, you go to the contractor's desk and I don't think they could care less whether they sold you something or not. And when you're a businessman or trying to be a businessman and conduct a business, there was a day and time whenever somebody would go in and spend several thousand dollars in your facility that they would break their neck to make sure you were taken care of. And it doesn't happen today. And Jimmy, I was finding it hard to love some folks yesterday. I'm not going to lie to you. I saw them for who they were right in front of me. I did not see who they could be. I was not looking at them through the lens of the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, I'll go this far, this far to say, and this may come out funny, but it, it, it's, if you stop and think of the seriousness, it, it's very, very serious and dire. Look at those folks and like, I don't want to spend eternity with these fools. 
I mean, honestly, let's be real. We've all had that take part at some point in time in our life. But you know the problem, the thing that convicted me so much that when Jimmy was speaking this morning, at that point in time, my focus wasn't on Christ. My focus was not on the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. My focus was on that job and the money that was being wasted as I was trying just to get loaded up with materials. And it makes you wonder if there is a balance there, because I don't think there is. One of the things we saw Wednesday night in looking at the names of God and, and, and proclaiming God and getting to know God through the names in the Old Testament. Kana, and I'm going to say that wrong, and if one of my teachers is listening to me, uh, I apologize. Q-A-N-N-A -N -N -A means jealous. It's a Semitic version of jealous. Actually, I'm sorry, it's not Semitic. It's a, a, God, I'm failing this class before I even took it. Uh, it is actually Greek, uh, but it means that God is a jealous God. He doesn't want to share us with anybody, but He wants us to share Him with everybody. And I did not proclaim God and His Son, Christ Jesus, at any point in time yesterday. And that conviction, man, it had me in a stranglehold this morning. Still does. But just to let you know, that's the kind of guy that you've got behind this pulpit right now. I'm flawed to the core. I have weakness in the same flesh that you guys have. But the beauty of it is I have the opportunity, like we were also told, I don't have to go to a priest to confess my sins. I confess my sins from that walk, from that fellowship hall to here. And you know what? You know what I know about that? It's gone. It's under the blood. I just wanted, I know that's a side note, but I just wanted to share that with you guys this morning. Look, like the kids say nowadays, the struggle's real. It is difficult for us to live out the model that Jesus has set before us. Let me, let me go further. It's impossible for us to live out the model that Jesus has set before us. He's the only one that could do it. But He equips us with this very same Holy Spirit to work through that. That day by day, we lean more on Him. We surrender more to Him. He gives us more. You talk about hope. Yeah, there's hope in the second coming of Christ Jesus, but there's hope that His Holy Spirit is with us daily, encouraging us, giving us the abilities to recall His Word and give us get the courage to speak to others on the behalf of Christ Jesus. Let's move on into verse 4 here because this is really starting our journey right here. And being assembled together with them, He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which... He said, you have heard from me. And you look at that, there's two peculiar things. Which is in quotation marks, and it's in red. So we know that that is the words of Christ Jesus, or the word from Christ Jesus. But what's peculiar about this is the way it's structured, and then it says, He, being Jesus, said, and again... Quotation marks, you have heard from me. And 
And it goes further in verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And this structure is very, very peculiar, but it's for a reason. We're going to see here in just a second in verse 6, the followers of Christ at that time, when, they, when Jesus said the promise of the Father, you know, they're probably trying to figure out which promise. We have multiple promises from God that you, Jesus, you're the Son of God, proclaim to us. And as we'll see, they immediately jumped to the end of the story. And they had a good reason for that. But I think it was to grab their attention. Jesus did this on purpose. To say, hey, be aware of what I have said and done in your presence. I'm going to get specific here in just a minute, but be aware of them all. They all had a purpose. I didn't walk on water for nothing. Because guess what, Peter? Peter? You stepped out in faith. Everybody thinks it's, oh, it's about me. It's about me. And in that instance, I think it really was about Peter. Jesus walked on water just because He can. And I don't know if y'all know this, but He hadn't gotten weak and feeble over the years. He still can. That was for Peter. Peter. And you know what? Peter did the same thing we would all have done. Once he realized what he stepped out into, he's like, oh man, woe is me. And he started sinking. And Jesus was right there. You took the step. That's what I needed you to do. You're safe. Because I called you, you, go, you went, you did, and I'm here. And that's the model. Christ is never going to call you. The Holy Spirit is never going to provoke you to do a thing or say a thing and then abandon you. Man, how awesome is that? But if you're like me, a lot of times I can hear that provoking, I can hear that, that, uh, that still small voice to say, Go do this. And immediately, in my conflicted little mind, I'm like, okay, Lord, I heard what you said. Now I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And we're going to do it this way. We're going to need this. And we're going to add to this. And the next thing you know, I'm upside down in the mud. Because he's still here saying, what in the world have you, what, where did you just take this? I said go. I'm going to provide all, the, all you need. And somehow you just muddied it all up in your own strength, in your flesh. Woo, I've been there. Man, more times than I want to tell you guys, I can tell you that. And the next thing you know, you're exhausted, you're drained, and you're like, oh my gosh, and before it's all said and done, you're like, I can't even believe I did this. What was the purpose again? I know I'm the only one that has that, so y'all just learn from that. And hopefully y'all learn from that and y'all don't ever have to face those kind of issues. In verse 5 here, we're talking about, basically, this is Joel 2, 28. And we're going to see this again, because not only is Jesus referring back to quoting Joel 2.28, but Peter's going to do the exact same thing here shortly. But let's, I'll tell you what. Let's turn, let's turn to Joel 2.28. I ain't got nowhere to be. Somebody tell me where that's at. That's, 
That's way back in the day. Joel 228. <laughs> I'm 100 pages off for some reason. Again, there's a reason for this because we're going to hear this in two consecutive chapters in Acts. But in Joel 2.28 it says, And it shall come to pass afterward, afterward, keep that in mind, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. Hmm. Wow. Joel got the 411 way back when. We're getting to see, we're about to see this take place. And there's more wonders if you continue to read the rest of that uh, chapter 2 in Joel. Woo! Man, there's some stuff fixing to happen. Afterwards. What Christ went through on our behalf was more than just taking on our sins and our debts before God. It was opening the door to an entire new era of the church. The thing we need to keep in mind though is by no means does the house of Israel stand in our rear view mirror. They are not condemned because of this. Because that sin that Christ bore on the cross on our behalf wasn't the sins of the Jews. It wasn't the sins of those who would call upon Christ and become Christians. It is the sins of all. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Every single one. How people can sit there and say, oh, you know, God only ordained that certain people would call upon His name or be saved. And they take Scripture and they twist it and they warp it to be able to fit that. And it is nonsense. Absolute nonsense. All have the opportunity. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. One of the things that we're going to see again also in future study in the book of Acts is how this gospel of John, this teaching of John, this ministry of John, doesn't fade away. You know, there are, we're going to see as Paul goes into his travels, that there are people afar off that are still being baptized with water and still adhering to the message of John. I think you're going to see that uh, it's a Apollos. Y'all remember that? Uh, where hey, do we do we serve Peter? I mean, I'm sorry. Do we serve Paul or do we serve Apollos? You remember that verse? Is it? I hope. Well, that is that very same situation. Apollos was brought up and taught into the ministry of John, and people were lacking. They did not have the Holy Spirit because they were not baptized into the Holy Spirit. They knew nothing of it. And we're going to see that. We're going to see that play out. In verse 6, it says, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Him, saying, Lord, will You at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? So we can see here, at this point in time, that they may not have gotten that this promise of the Father was the Holy Spirit. They were thinking, because they have their blinders on, they're from it, the, that house of Israel, they are wanting deliverance. They have been under the thumb 
of many empires because of their own doing or not doing. We don't understand that here in the United States. I think we're starting to feel it. It won't be long, and I think that's going to that that's going to become more prevalent in the lives of Christians. But they were under that burden. They were shackled by their rulers. And they had been that way for hundreds of years. And you can understand why that would be their first question. We see, we, we may have had some doubts and we may have been fuzzy on what it was that you were teaching us, Jesus. But after this resurrection thing, we know you have the ability to do it. No doubt you have the power to pull this off. Now? Now? It's like a kid waiting for a cake to cool down. Can we cut into it now? What's very peculiar that we'll see in this next verse is Jesus' answer. In verse 7, I'm sorry. And He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in His own authority, but you shall receive power. And like he, he just skips right back. Hey, He almost like having to be grabbed by the ear and brought back over here like one of them old hunting dogs has a cold nose. You got to sort of direct them. Get back on the trail here, guys. Focus, focus. It's not for you to know. It's for the Father to know. But, this is what I need you to focus on right now. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There is your outline for the book of Acts right there in that one verse. And man, if we want to get down into the, the guts of this, this is, this is our call, guys. This is our call to arms right here. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus, this is exactly what He is calling you to do on His behalf. But again, like I said before, you aren't doing it on your own, in your own strength. You don't even have to plot out the course. You don't have to do anything. If your focus is on Him, and not some side job, and not some materials you've got to get at Lowe's, if your focus is on Him, everything else is going to be laid out. You're going to be able to hear what it is He has for you to do and say. You're going to know when to do it, because that prompting is going to hit, kick you in the gut like a mule. And there is going to be no limit, no limit to where He can take you in that ministry. But let's back up, let's back up a little bit there. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We're going to see also that how this plays out moving forward because if matter of fact you know I can actually see better without these things I must have some Holy Spirit power on me right now I can see scales have fallen off now I can't see that clock back there but I can see this if you look at John 20 let's see here Look at verse 21 through 23. John 20. Verse 21 says, So Jesus said to them again, 
peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. All right. So this is an abbreviated version of what we see here in Acts as our, our call to arms. So we know that His peace is going to be on to those who surrender to Him to do His, His bidding. The Father has sent Jesus. God has sent Jesus. And He sends us. And then you look at that and you're like, well, man, Jesus is not here. You know, if you send us and you're going to go away, you are not here. Here comes that hope. Remember, I, we always talk about there, there's, there's some question, there's some doubt. And if, but stay with it, because right, right after there, not long to come, is hope. Tw verse 22, And when He had said this, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. You're like, Coy, where are you going with this? By the time this takes place in Acts, these apostles already have the Holy Spirit. And you're going to scratch your head and you're like, what, what, I don't get it. What you're going to see here is that there is a difference between being baptized and the Holy Spirit and being empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I think Baptists, at least in our day and age, have this part so wrong, it's not even funny. We, we want to take the Holy Spirit and we want to say, okay, nothing can take me from my Father's hand. My salvation is secure and I'm going to rest in that. And that's good enough. And that mentality will never, never allow you to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, that is the first aspect of it. When you come to Christ Jesus, when you surrender to Christ Jesus, you are saved from that point on no matter how many times you screw up. No matter how many times Coy botches it up at Lowe's or Home Depot. That is secure. Like, the, like they say, take it to the bank. However, we got more than that. We're going to supersize this thing. When God has an appointment for you to serve Him in a, in a specific way, area, specific time, but for specific people, the very first thing we should do, which is what we talked about prior to even having votes next week or, uh, you know, hoping for the opportunity for ministry at a nur this nursing home, is you pray. Holy Spirit, if it be your will that we do this on the behalf of the kingdom of God, give us direction, give us the words to speak, give us the strength to endure. You just, and I'm not saying name it, claim it, don't get me wrong here, because, but when it comes to ministering on the behalf of Christ Jesus, you think He's going to hold anything back? No. He wants to stupefy the masses today just like Jesus did in His ministry, just like we're going to see Peter doing his, just like we're going to see Paul doing his. There is nothing more that our Savior would like to see of us to be committed to Him to such a degree that we say, rise. And the dead are raised. In the name of Christ Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And somehow, as Baptists, we've left that back in storage. It's collecting dust somewhere. I got my fire insurance. Praise be. And we wonder, we wonder why the church no longer has a voice in society. We wonder that we have deviants in positions of power. We wonder why kids can't determine who they are from day to day and have no identity and turn to everything other than Christ Jesus. Because for generations, we have not sought the face of God. And here we are reaping the whirlwind. But I can't figure it out. I don't know what's going on. You need to get your, you need to get your nose in this, in God's Word. And it will become really evident really fast. The beauty of that, the hope of that, you'll see that in Revelation as well. The opportunity is there. The change can be made. That old saying, you can't ever go too far. You would think we're right up there on the precipice right now. One more step, one more stumble, one more slip, and we're off the edge. But even in the point of falling, Christ can swoop us up and put us on that firm foundation. Do we have enough time to get in? Sure we do. Sure we do. Let's go to verse 9 real quick. Oh, wait, no, no, take it back. Let's, let's break down verse 8. Because like I said, this is, this is our outline for the entirety of the book of Acts. We got through there. We've received the Holy Spirit. And you shall be witnesses. To who? Me. Not, not, not this fat ball guy. Jesus. This is Jesus speaks. Red letters, guys. Pay attention. But it's funny. It's peculiar that everything that Jesus says has a reason. Where these words are placed, the order in which they're placed. And I want you to see this. In Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You stop and think about that in Jerusalem. When we hear Peter in just a few more verses in, uh, in, in chapter 2, actually, we see Peter endowed by the Holy Spirit, full of the Spirit, preaching and recounting Scripture, I mean, in, a, in just an insane way. Those people that are in the crowd, you got some of them said, oh, these guys are drunk. And they're like, man, no, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Come on. Then you have some of them say, well, hold on, I'm hearing this in my own language. Isn't that them dumb fisher boys from Galilee? Even people that were coming to Jerusalem to worship, to take part in Passover, understand that, man, I can tell by that Hicks accent, he's from Galilee. Isn't it difficult, if you stop and think about it, when we're looking at the, this is their, their backyard. This is their home court, where you would think, Winning people over to the name, for, to, in the name of Jesus would be simple. Stop and think about it. How difficult is it to share God with the people closest to you? Family especially. I bet there's not a soul in this sanctuary today that has one person in, that just pops to mind that 
you just cannot reach in your family. And that's where we got to start. The hardest ground to plow is right there under your own roof. And that's where Jesus said, hey, start off there. But there's a reason. If you can accomplish that, sky's the limit. If that can take place in your household, there's a couple things that are going to happen. One, you're going to be like, okay, if the Holy Spirit can do this, then He can do anything. If I can witness to someone that shares my blood, that shares my dwelling, and win them over to Christ Jesus, then there's no one I can't talk to about my Savior. But we tend to get it backwards. We want to go reach the ends of the earth, and people are lost as a goose right there under our own roof. I'm guilty of it. We'll spend thousands upon millions of dollars to send missionaries here, there, and yonder. And look at the United States. It's ironic, isn't it? But then when it, look what it says. It says, in all Judea. So it expands out a little bit more. But they still share one thing in common. In all Judea, we're still looking at the house of Israel. God loves His people. He has a place for the people of Israel. And we're going to, I really feel we're going to see it in our lifetimes. That we're going to see this take place and we're going to see all the gloves off as far as the opposition to the country of Israel and its people. We're at the precipice of that right now. But you, then again, you're going to see a rallying around those people. And look at the next one. I want you to go to the people that you detest and you can't stand them sun guns. I want you to go to Lowe's, Coy. It's not just Lowe's. I don't like Home Depot either. But anyway. All kidding aside. And this is the part I struggle in. Y'all heard me say before, because I grew up in Cedar Grove at a at a the height of transition between people groups there. There is a, a prejudice that Satan planted in me. And it is one that is difficult to overcome. So much so that the vast majority of people that I come across are the sweetest folks you'll ever come across. But it doesn't take but one to really show themselves in the flesh and I automatically put an umbrella over an entire people group. Now thankfully God is working on me hard in that area. Has been for quite some time. But this is definitely one of those that when you clean out that house... You better put something of God back in it. Otherwise, Satan and seven of his other buddies are coming back in. Mm. Thank you, Lord. He's still working on me there. And then to the end of the earth. You know, we are still with all our technology and everything that we've got going on, there are still, and I want to say, 
can't remember if it was 11 or 13. I think that one of the two. They, they, I think there are one of the two, 11 or 13, that I heard uh, in a radio interview, people groups that have not been touched with the message of Christ. And I don't know how that could be possible in today's day and age, you know. But, then again, there are people, there are, there are people groups in the United States. I got to witness that in inner city missions in New York. That at one point in time, one of their family members way back when may have heard of Christ. But their day-to-day -day life is so focused on themselves and whatever they've got going on that they are blind, deaf, and dumb to the gospel. Couldn't tell you no more who Jesus was than the man in the moon. And sadly, at least some of them that I met, their lives are evidence of it. We're going to get to see the next Sunday as we go on. This sort of leaves us not open-ended, but it, it's a transition right, that's fixing to take place between 8 and 9 here. And we're going to have another one that's going to take place after Christ's ascension. But again, if we looked at this but, and you just took what it is that God is calling you to do and He says, okay, I need you to do that on your own in your own strength, your own power, whatever that may be, you take care of that. Oh my gosh. I'd huddle up into a ball and weep. But we have the hope. Now that's more than hope. It's way more than hope. Especially if you've ever felt the power of the Holy Spirit. You know it's more than hope. You know it's a reality. But it's a reality that we have not been equipped to utilize. And I hope that we'll get that as we go ahead. We'll be able to see those models and how that takes place. And then that empowerment of the Holy Spirit will fall upon us. We'll be able to utilize it to such a degree that there is not a thing that we can't do in the name of Christ Jesus and for Christ Jesus. That's my hope. That's my hope. Let's end it right there, guys. We are... Uh, Oh, yeah, man, we're way ahead of time. Y'all going to be able to get uh, get a nap in before you come back, get some ice cream. Whew. I'm going to actually, I'm going to do like those people who uh, take part in those eating um, venues, like the hot dogs and stuff like that. I'm going to go stretch my stomach with ice cream to get ready for ice cream. So... I hope to see you guys back here tonight for that. Look, as we prepare to go before God in prayer, I don't think there's a soul here that can say that, oh yeah, I'm, I'm beyond all that. I'm so sanctified. I guarantee you there is some aspect of your life that God is wanting to take that burden from you. I've got way more than one. Let's take this opportunity in prayer to present that before God. To God, help me with this through Your Son, Jesus Christ, and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Help me in whatever area that may be. It may be something that you need to take to this altar and leave at this altar. Or you can pray right there. But I'm here. Get that off of you. We need you. I want to see the, I want to see the Holy Spirit 
and you on fire with the Holy Spirit in the days to come. God has a specific ministry for each and every one of us. And I want to see it to the fullest and be there to praise God through it all. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank You for Your Word. How it is just alive and springing forth truth into this lost and perverse generation. Lord, I pray that You would allow us the opportunity to pull that basket off that lampstand that you lit, you lit Yourself as we surrendered into the precious name of Jesus Christ. Father, help us to so shine before men that all our deeds and our works proclaim You and glorify You. Lord, that there, if there be a hindrance in our relationship, that right now we would surrender that to You. Lord, we know just like Paul, we're going to continue to have those thorns in our flesh. But just like Paul, Lord, we need to realize that you are going to give us the ability to prevail in your name no matter what you allow us to carry. Some of those thorns in our flesh are there just to prevent us from going out in our own strength and in this flesh and defiling your name. Some of those thorns in our flesh are a reminder of a trial that we've gone through. That you have brought us through. Lord, we don't detest them. Lord, we thank you for them. Just as you showed your scars to your disciples, Lord, let us show our scars to this world that they may be brought to You and Your name be glorified. Father God, we take this time to surrender our lives, to submit our shortcomings to our Creator. May all that we do and all that we say bring glory to the name of Christ Jesus. Amen.